Thumb and Schroeder, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and ESCAP today. Thank you for having me. In June at our ESCAP Expert Day, you'll have a keynote presentation entitled Sleep Dependent Mental Health in Child and Adolescence. Your area of expertise is sleep disorders, um, but can you give us a little insight into what you'll discuss at the, at the meeting? I think, first of all, I will introduce um, a bit on the concept of um, sleep uh, and uh, to bring us back to the basic idea why we sleep and what's actually the function of sleep and what's the function of sleep, especially in uh, also typical development. Um, and I will stress in the very beginning that um, uh, sleep and sleep-wake rhythms are really essential uh, for children's development, that actually even sleep architecture, the way how we sleep, will adapt always um, to the developmental age of the child to optimally reinforce learning processes, for example, or also um, mood um, uh, balance. Um, and so these, I think, are um, really essential notions, especially as today, where sometimes um, children sleep much less than they used to sleep. We have very interesting data on that. And also where children are much more often um, um, in sleep delays, for example, on the weekends. So usually yeah. that's something that we observe specifically for adolescents, where it's very classical that adolescents go to sleep much later on the weekends and they wake up later. But um, with over the years, we have observed a shift uh, towards younger ages. And now we know that even children in primary school or even in preschool will actually have slightly um, sleep delays on the weekends. And I will talk a bit about these impacts really on a general societal level um, on uh, development in children before going on into the subject of child psychiatric disorders. We we'll definitely focus on um, neurodevelopmental uh, disorders such as um, um, ASD or ADHD, uh, but we will also ta talk about um, adolescents um, and um, the, the very strong link that has been shown uh, between uh, sleep disturbances and um, suicidal behavior, because I think that's another important aspect, again, to stress how st sleep can be one of the signs that show us um, that um, there is a higher risk um, uh, of um, uh, suicidal ideation or uh, su suicidal behavior. So what are the current treatment strategies and I, I suppose for patients that have say autism but also typically developing children that have sleep disturbances? Mm -hmm. So th there's obviously a general framework that we could talk about for all children and adolescents, and then there are specific frameworks for um, uh, specific neurodevelopmental disorders where we know uh, that there's um, uh, a very particular um, physiopathology involved. So the general over general idea is, first of all, we will obviously screen for uh, specific sleep disturbances such as sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement disorder, nocturnal epilepsy. So we will definitely check, do we need to do some additional explorations of sleep? Do we have to send uh, the children or adolescents to the sleep lab and they might get uh, treatment for specific sleep disorders? Or are we in the framework of insomnia or the insomnia spectrum? In that case, we do not necessarily need to have um, uh, complementary um, evaluations and we will talk about that too. So when would we decide to send the child for complementary uh, studies or when do we not need to do that and we can explore with questionnaires or sleep logs, for example. If we have decided we go for that for the insomnia um, symptomatology, then we will evaluate it with the family over several weeks usually, uh, where the family fills out sleep logs, added by questionnaires, and then we will identify with them if there are uh, specific sleep hygiene errors, or what we rather say, if there could be improvements made to a good behavior around sleep. And we will um, help the family to find out what could be exactly improved. Um, so that means regular rhythms, usually to have a specific routine at night that will, re that will reassure um, children, uh, but also adolescents, um, a very predictable um, uh, evening until they go to bed. Uh, we will look if there are, uh, is too much screen use, and then we will discuss how we can we reduce a screen uh, time in the evening, not only for the child or the adolescents, but maybe also for the whole family. <laughs> Um, if there are any errors around um, the food intake, um, so for example, if there's too much um, uh, feeding that's still going on at night, or whereas the child is at the age where 
he or she doesn't might not need um, um, any any kind of milk, for example, anyway. So all these things will be looked at uh, in a non-judgmental manner, obviously. So we're trying really to find out what could be improved um, on this level. Once that has been um, achieved, then we will go into a phase where we usually have cognitive behavior treatment approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and they can go from, uh, first of all, putting into place relaxation methods, and then there are different methods that have been shown uh, to work, um, going then um, to um, uh, more methods like either um, gradual um, extinction uh, that can, is particularly effective in younger children, or uh, bedtime fading techniques that I will quickly explain during my talk, which um, might be also very effective for children with neurodevelopmental disorders or uh, intellectual deficiencies. Um, and for older children and adolescents, we will then go into cognitive treatment um, where uh, we can add other aspects to it. And if all of this has been then we will re-evaluate. This is usually over a period of one to three months, I would say, um, to see um, is has full treatment success been achieved in many children which uh, have neurotypical development insomnia treatment in this manner leads to about 80 to 90 percent of success so okay. it's very very yeah. very efficient however in children with neurodevelopmental disorders or if i give the example for uh, for autism uh, the success will be around 25 percent so this shows us that there might be additional treatment needed and then it can be pharmacological treatment and this would then depend however on the underlying disorder that's very different obviously for um, ASD for example or if we have an adolescent with uh, depressive symptomatology um, uh, and uh, this would be something I can uh, at least give some examples of treatments um, that are currently available. So thank you so much for speaking with me. And thank you. It's been Thank great. Thank you. I mean, I'm very, very happy to get the subject of sleep across to child psychiatrists because I think it's still underestimated, really, um, in, in, in terms of evaluation. Uh, child psychiatrists don't think um, about asking, and parents uh, are sometimes so trained to think, oh, this might not be of interest for a child psychiatrist psychiatrists that even don't they don't talk in those consultations about sleep but they keep it for example for their pediatrician and yeah. that's that's a pity because um uh, then the child psychiatrist doesn't know about uh, it and can't um, help uh, take care of it so i think i hope i get this idea across. <laughs>